So I'm Tom Raimondo, I'm a geologist uh, here at UniSA. Um, I teach into the environmental science and into the civil engineering degrees as well. Um, and I guess my research, I do a lot of my field work and things like that in Central Australia, so I'm really interested in Central Australian geology. Um, and in particular, I guess if you've ever been to Alice Springs or any places like that, you can't fail to notice that there's some very spectacular mountain ranges out there. The McDonnell Ranges are, are a very popular tourist attraction and things like that. The unusual thing about them, I suppose, is that they're part of a very large um, system that we call a mountain belt system, I guess. And the, the really curious thing about them is that they formed in the middle of a tectonic plate. Um, which is a very unusual scenario if you think about most of the very typical mountain belt systems that we're familiar with, like the Himalayas or the Andes or something like that, they're all right at the margins of a tectonic plate. So what I'm interested in is how exactly do you manage to produce these mountain belts right in the centre of a tectonic plate, which is a very bizarre kind of scenario to have. And in particular, I'm interested in the role that fluids play in enabling continental crust to deform and produce mountain belts and things like that. So that really comes down to, because you're studying fluids and the effect they have on deformation and mountain building and so on, it really comes down a lot of the time to geochemistry, trying to understand how the chemistry of fluids affects um, their behaviour, the way they interact with rocks, whether they strengthen them or weaken them and all those sort of things. So that's really, I guess, the focus of my research. A bit of big scale problems like how um, plate tectonics works and how plates deform, but also very small scale things like how do fluids interact with rocks and how can we understand their chemistry. So the research I can tell you about today was all about, again, that, that small scale issue of um, how can we look at rocks and how can we characterise them better to understand more about their properties. Um, so whenever you're dealing with a very big scale issue, you often you don't have the opportunity to analyse it as a whole. You need to take very small pockets of it, I guess, and analyse them in more detail and then extrapolate or interpolate based on those little, little tiny data sets that you have from those smaller scale problems. So the issue that we face, and, and an issue that geologists face across the board really, is that whenever they analyse geological materials, often the records that they extract from those materials are incomplete. Um, so, for example, and a mineral that I deal with a lot is garnet. Garnet's a very powerful mineral because it gives you a heap of information about different processes. So it can tell you about the ages of events, it can tell you about the pressure conditions that, that rocks formed under, the temperature conditions, it can tell you about their mineralisation potential, um, the redox conditions, a whole bunch of different um, parameters that you might be interested in. When you analyse garnet though, you're only ever analysing a very small, minute portion of it really, you know, uh, micrometres really is, is the kind of scale of each individual spot that you might use a particular bit of analytical infrastructure when you're analysing that material. So the issue that I face, and an issue that most other geologists will face when they're analysing garnet, is that they only ever access a tiny, tiny portion of that mineral, let alone you know, the role that that mineral plays within a rock itself and then the rock itself within a much larger geological system. So what we wanted to do was, I guess, increase the amount of information available from a mineral like garnet by not just using spot analyses, you know, a whole series of individual um, volumes of material from a single mineral that we're analysing, but actually map it. So look over a much larger spatial scale at the way that elements or isotopes or other chemical components are distributed amongst the garnet. And that meant that we needed to basically take existing analytical infrastructure and modify it so that we can, instead of just having a series of spots, we can produce a map of that element. And as soon as you've got a map, it's, I guess it's kind of like if you had, a, if you had a, uh, a map of heights or you're looking at a topographic map or something like that and all you ever had was a height here and a height there and a height there. You'd never get any understanding of how the topography was actually, um, you know, actually constructed. You wouldn't know where the hills were, where the valleys were or anything like that. You'd only have a series of fairly meaningless um, height readings or so on. I guess analysing the chemistry of garnet is not that dissimilar. If you've got a value here and a value there and a value somewhere else, you, you don't really have a very good understanding of how it's distributed, what the, what the zoning patterns and things like that are. So what we wanted to try and achieve is adapt some existing infrastructure to develop a map of minerals. And as soon as you do that, you're accessing a whole wealth of information. Um, so that was one of the challenges, going from, get, you know, there's very small scale information that we've got from just spots to an entire map. 
And in order to do that, I guess, um, we needed to bring in a whole range of different people. You needed people with geological expertise, you needed um, people with computer programming skills and things like that to modify the existing um, software that's used to process the data. You needed to introduce people with GIS expertise who can then take that um, quantified data and, and plot it out spatially. Um, you need people um, with backgrounds in, in, in the specific um, geological um, uh, areas that these sort of um, techniques can be applied, you know, so that they can come up with well-constrained um, applications for this sort of empirical data. So we had to bring in a range of different people to come up with the idea, to develop it, to kind of um, produce the, the data that we needed and then come up with an effective way to display it. So a range of different people, I guess, were involved in that process. The research was conducted really through a range of different steps. Okay, so if you took the first step, I guess the, 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 the initial idea was that um, the, the very small um, spot data that we have is completely incomplete. That was the initial idea. How can we improve going from a series of spots to a much more useful and, and uh, representative map of a particular mineral? So that was the initial idea. And that, was, uh, that idea actually came out of a person at Adelaide University, Martin Hand. He was the guy who looked at, the, looked at the problem and said, you know what, what we need is a map. A map is a much better represent, representation of the data. So that was the first step. I guess the second step and, uh, was really to say, okay, what existing an analytical infrastructure do we have and how can we modify it from its normal operation of just collecting a series of spots to then producing a map? Um, so that involved uh, um, getting some expertise in the microscopy area. So people that use these instruments on a daily basis are involved in collecting this sort of data and consulting them and saying, is there a way that we can modify this data or modify the collection techniques in order to produce a map? So what we did is we went to, um, there was a geologist involved, Justin Payne, who's now at UniSA, he was involved, and also a guy called Ben Wade who works at Adelaide Microscopy and, and, and is basically uh, responsible for much of the analytical data collection over there. So we had to consult them about really about the technical expertise to get this to happen. Once we'd figured out a way to do it, we needed to involve uh, the next step, which is really um, a way to um, get, I guess, collect the data and collect some geological materials that were going to be suitable to test the technique. Because once you've figured out a way that you can do something, you need to verify it. You need to, um, I guess, in, in geology, what you really need is what we call standard materials. So things of known composition, um, things that have been very well characterised, that then you can apply to a new technique. If you get the answer you're expecting, then you know that the technique's working well. So that's where I came in, and that's where another guy called Chris Clark came in. We'd been using a number of different geological materials, garnet and other, other minerals as well, that have been very well characterised through our studies and through other people's studies. We then introduced them. They, we applied them to this new technique and we discovered that, you know, what we were getting the answers that we were expecting. So everything was good. You know, we were kind of quite happy with the way things were turning out. The next step then was once we'd collected the data, once we were getting the expected values and things like that, we needed to figure out a way to present the data. Um, and that really came down to some GIS skills and some computer programming skills. We needed people that could um, take a whole series, a matrix of data points basically and then present them spatially in terms of a 2D or a 3D image that can be easily interpreted. A bunch of numbers on a page is not that useful really. You need to be able to present it in a way that's informative and in a way that's easily interpreted. So that's where the, that GIS um, knowledge and also the computer programming knowledge. You, you stick the, the, the data into a computer program, you need to be able to manipulate it, you need to be able to um, you know, kind of uh, change some variables so that it, it gets tweaked or modified and, and produces the output that you're expecting and that it's easily manageable. So that's where a lot of that sort of expertise came into it. Um, so, you know, as I, uh, I've kind of described, I guess, there are a whole range of different expertise. It really was a multidisciplinary team of people involved from the initial idea all the way through to its development and its realisation and then its implementation. The research outcomes really were that we went from uh, the existing techniques, which only had a very limited amount of data that you could get from particular geological materials, to a huge library of information that you could get using this new technique. So, um, you know, we went from being able to collect four particular elements, for example, from, from something like garnet to 
I think at last count, we the last uh, set of maps that I produced had 38 different um, elements and not just spots, but actual whole maps that you could look at and interpret, compare from one to the other and so on. So that was fantastic for our own outcomes. But the remarkable thing, I guess, is that it had a whole bunch of spin-offs into completely different areas and completely different disciplines and so on. So for example, uh, we went from analysing geological materials to analysing leaves, um, mouse brains, uh, teeth and other things like that. So it's not just a, a tool that has geological appl applications, but it's got medical applications, biological applications, applications to basically any science that needs to understand the chemical distribution of any particular material. The, the real advantage of this technique is that you can apply it to basically anything that you can stick in a very small cell that you then shove into the apparatus. So um, it, it, you know, that, that, that simple idea that we have of the current techniques aren't good enough, we want to get build up a map of a particular mineral has now had spin-offs into a whole range of different disciplines um, and different applications. So I guess that's another example of where multidisciplinary ideas can contribute to a particular discipline, but you often find as well that they often filter through and feed through into a range of other kind of applications and things that you didn't expect really when we started. So that's a, that's a really fantastic and encouraging output, I guess, of the project.